Frank Moore had known Harrison, Chandra had known Harrison. I also assumed that she'd spited me into her parlor for purposes other than social. And that notion was seconded soon after I had it, when somebody kicked the door open. Hey, you think you're Jenny, darling? The two boys in the door were not from Western Union. And ugly as they were, Chandra left my side to join them, which made me think that maybe my senior class had been right. Looking at that trio six eyes and two guns glaring at me, I wished I was a bookkeeper. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first... Here it is almost the end of February. All over the country, people are thinking about their new cars. All but one man. And he remains quite content with his old automobile and wearing apparel. An ancient Maxwell and a well-worn toupee. For these reasons and for several others, named Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester, he now has the number one comedy show in America. All over the country, people think about him, too, every Sunday night. Hear the Jack Benny Show with Claude Rains as Jack's special guest next Sunday on all these same CBS network stations. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The men with the guns, described from left to right, were a fat man with three chins and a bald dome, and with him, a punk with a sneer and arms that were too long for the rest of them. They gun muzzled me into a chair and started making anything but sense. Mm. Very well, son of my dear. <laughs> We are at last face to face with the mysterious stranger, Johnny Dollar. Oh, don't kill the suspense and tell me why. He knows why. He came to the Wardlow Bar. He knew about Frank Moore, and he was looking for the other one, Harrison. That is why I phoned you. Well, <clears throat> it would seem then that this unfortunate chain of events is leading the final link. Yeah, this guy uses his head better than Harrison did. Well, Dollar? I'm using my head right now. Splendid, splendid. So doing, you may well prevent Harrison's death. As well as your own. Oh, well, that's better than nothing. But uh, is that all you can offer? Skip the bargaining, Russ Line. Takes too much time. Quiet, Corgi. The times when money is cheaper than the results of your kind of blind violence. Well, Dollar, you do have a price. Take a tip from my last name. Start bidding. I tell you, you're nuts, Russ Line. You aren't sure he knows where it is. He must know. He was looking for help, and they both know. You'll be quiet, both of you. 500 pounds English dollar. Where is it? At times like this, I keep my mouth shut and my ears open. 750. Surely, Dollar, since you've entered the situation at such a late date, that is property enough. Oh, well, I'm a man of expensive tastes. I've always aspired to such things as $200 cigarette lighters. Go ahead. Keep spitting out that wise talk and you'll be spitting out teeth. How'd you like to go swimming with your hands and feet tied? I could bite my tongue. <clears throat> uh, not, not just yet, Corgi, my boy. <clears throat> this man is worthless, dead. Uh, perhaps, Dolly, we can induce you to talk in much the same way as we could prepare to pat it by <clears throat> slitting the tongue. You know, Rosalind, your mother must have been scared by Sidney Greenstreet. Why, you... Either this guy is nuts or he doesn't know anything. What I know would fill a police blotter. Okay. You know nothing of psychology, my boy. What this man is attempting to pass off as a show of bravery is based purely on the knowledge that he is, momentarily at least, of some considerable value to us alive. Now, Dollar, be careful. Before you make your final decision, bear in mind you've heard our final offer. Now, sir, what should it be? Oh, the squirrel, the squirrel said to the little girl when she asked him what he wanted for Christmas, nuts. Very well, Dollar. Corgi. Thanks. <laughs> finally came to in the dark, trussed up like a turkey, and lay there trying to figure it out. Obviously, the two rude dudes thought I knew something I didn't know. But what I did know was that finding Harrison had turned into a big, fat headache. Also, that I had accomplished exactly nothing towards speeding the SS Shanghai Wayfarer over the bounding main. While I was comforting myself by repeating over and over that old insurance company soother, never say die, I discovered I wasn't alone. Hello. Huh? You, who are you? Well, you were here first, you tell me. Well, my name is Harrison. Harrison? Yes, who are you? I'm Johnny Dollar. 
I was sent out here by the Oriental West Cargo Bonding Company. Oriental West? Yes, I was supposed to do what you couldn't get done. And look at me now. Getting hit over the head and dumped in here must be par for the course. How long have you been here, and why? I've been driving myself crazy trying to figure that out. Well, this little guest house, wherever we are, must only have one set of proprietors. I can tell you who they are, at least by the names they're using tonight. Rosalind and Corgi. They offer me 750 English pounds to tell them where something called It was. What is it? Well, it's a package. What's in it, I don't know. It belonged to the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer, Frank Moore. He was helping me try to get the ship on its way, and I, I owed him a favor. He asked me to drop this package at a bar. The, the, the Wardlow bar, yeah, go ahead. That's right. I was supposed to give it to a girl named Chandra. She wasn't there, so I got her address and went out to her place. You mean that package is at Chandra's house? Yes. When I got out there, the Chinese maid let me in. I, I waited as long as I could, and then rather than leave what might be a valuable package just lying around loose, I, I put it into the bottom drawer of a dresser and left. Oh, great. For such things, I go around laying down my life. Well, it's obvious that these men will stop at nothing to get their hands on that package. Well, when they asked you where it was, why didn't you tell them? Then neither one of us would be here. What's more, I'm beginning to think the sooner they get the package, the sooner our ship sails. Frank Moore had been a good friend to me. He wanted Chandra to have it, and I, I couldn't just turn it over to those two. Well, I've got some news for you. And this should make you really unhappy. Those two happen to be in business with Chandra. Huh? They're all on the same team. She's one of them. What an idiot I've been. Uh, well, here we are, all roped up. You know, for a pair of guys who came out here to speed a shipload of raw tin on its way, we're doing just dandy. We're lucky if we get this thing alive. Offhand, I'd say our host probably murdered Frank Moore trying to get that package. Maybe we're next. Uh-oh. Maybe right now. A beam from a powerful flashlight stabbed us in the eyes. The sudden change from too much dark to too much light kept us blinded. Well, look who's here. At least the voice behind the glare wasn't Rosalind's and it wasn't Corgi's. But it was a familiar voice, one I'd heard and heard lately. He walked in on us, the flash in one hand and in the other, a knife with a six-inch blade. At first I wondered whether it was the one that had been buried in Frank Moore's back. And then I remembered where I'd seen it before. The man bending over us was the burly gangway watch from the Shanghai Wayfarer. And you told me to watch out for pirates. Well, this situation is getting a little overcrowded. I didn't think there was room for any more. What do you want? You know what I want, Dollar. The same thing Roslyn and Corgi are ripping your hotel room apart for right now. Now, don't tell me you're looking for it, too. Two things I know about that package, mister. The name is Rourke. Okay, Rourke. One thing I know is that it's dangerous company. The other is I want no part of it. The only thing I'm interested in is getting the Shanghai Wayfarer out of port. That won't be hard once I get that package. Where is it, Dollar? Uh, I'll trade the answer to that question for a little freedom. Okay, hold still. Uh, Thanks. Nice. Harrison's next. I want him with us in case he's lying. All right. Okay, Harrison, roll over. Hey, you! When Rock bent over Harrison, I dropped kicked the flashlight out of his hand, ran across the darkened room, through the open door, and kept on running. Sometimes the long way around is the shortest way home, so I headed for Chandra's house. I not only had some getting even to do, but I had some curiosity to satisfy. Somehow the Shanghai Wayfarer's failure to sail on schedule was tied up with a mysterious package. But how? Why? I decided I'd earn the right to see what was in that package. Johnny! I didn't want you to be lonely. I heard your playmates are over making themselves at home in my room. So I thought you and I could have a little chat. Maybe I've got a surprise for you. What, Johnny? I think I know where that package is. Johnny! You get that package. We both don't worry for the rest of our lives. But we must hurry before Rosalind and Corgi come back. We go now. Okay, where's your bedroom? Johnny, what do you mean? Now, oh, come on, where is it? Come, I'll show you. No, it cannot be. It's not the yeah. one, no. And it's been oh. here all the time. Oh. And now while I open this thing, you can go and have yourself a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Hey, this is more fun than unwrapping Christmas presents. And now I take off the cover. Wow. Now I know how the winner feels on Hit the Jackpot. The package 
package was paper all the way through, brown wrapping on the outside and green spending on the inside. Big bundles of fresh, clean American 20s. Thousands of the same kind of bills that the Singapore police had found in the late Frank Moore's wallet. It would have taken half a day to count it, and I'd wasted too much time already. It'll be no good to you without me, Johnny. You have to know how to get rid of them. Oh, counterfeit, huh? Yes. They are made in China. Frank Moore brought them from Shanghai to Roslyn to take to the States, but Roslyn was not here in Singapore. He was late, so Frank had to make some accidents happen to his ship to keep it from sailing. But then he changed his mind. He decided he would give the money himself. But Roslyn caught up with him. I see. He was sending them to you by way of Harrison, just before he was knifed by Roslyn, huh? Who talked him into that? You, by any chance? You and I could be very rich, Johnny. You never give up, do you? There's $500,000 there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should buy about 50 years in jail. I'm taking this down to customs and you with it. No, I do not think you do. Uh-huh. Time to play another visiting team. Come on, beautiful. I don't want you in the way. Let go of me, Allison. I grabbed her, lashed her wrist with a cord from the package, and since she liked money so much, I stuffed her mouth with a fistful of those troublesome $20 bills. I locked her and the rest of the loot into a closet and dashed into the other room looking for a weapon. And then I remembered that Louisville slugger from the U.S. Marines. I was glad they'd landed. I grabbed it off the wall, got a toehold in the carpet on the left side of that door, wrapped my fingers around the bat, swung it on the back of my shoulder, and waited. Thunder. Thunder, my dear. We just came out. Two outs and one to go. No! No! Three outs, and the side is retired. What a ball game. Now, first, I take your guns. And now we sit and wait for you to wake up. I'll take over from here on in, Dollar. Huh? Oh, I don't know about that, Rourke. I happen to be the guy who has the gun. Oh? Well, here. Take a look at this. What's in your wallet that I want to look at? More hot 20s? I'm not taking my eyes off you, Rourke. Okay, I'll turn around with my hands up and then you can look at it. Okay, fair enough. But if you so much as move, I'll start shooting. That's the deal. Oh, it's a fine time to learn this. Are you satisfied? John Joseph Rourke, U.S. Treasury Department. Come on in. I'm sorry I couldn't come out into the open before, Dollar, but I was too close to the payoff of this case to take any chances. Well, you know, I'm beginning to think that just being in this town is taking chances. That counterfeit's been funneling through this port on its way from China for months. We had more staked out for a long time, but this is the first shot we had at the top. That's him, him lying there on the floor, Ross. Now I've got him. Oh, your pal Harrison told me where I can find the only other thing I need, that package of hot money in the dresser drawer. Oh, it's now moved into the bedroom closet. Along with a package of hot woman. Well, then, Dollar, it looks like my job out here is just about done. Yeah, I guess so. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? You're from the Treasury Department. Yes? Well, then, after you get all these birds into their cages, how about helping me make out my income tax? <laughs> Expense account, item six. Hotel bill, one night in Singapore, five dollars. Item seven... One new outfit, replacing mine, which was ruined in course of taking midnight dip in Singapore River, $200. Item eight, $20. Bar checks for cheering up one William Harrison, your expediter, whose innocence had him running errands for the man who was holding up the departure of your ship. Item nine, $375. Spent while killing time until the departure of my plane back to the States. After the Shanghai Wayfarer finally sailed. You see, this time, I had four hours on my hands instead of the two you allowed me in San Francisco. Expense account total, $1,407. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, for more exciting drama in the mystery and adventure line, remember CBS 2 thrill-packed Saturday night shows, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters. Be sure to hear Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters tomorrow night on most of these same CBS network stations. 
Next week, CBS will take you adventuring with Johnny Dollar, hitting the hot spots in Palm Beach and New Orleans with the star of Hades.